Hello and thank you all for viewing. This is the first part of my two-part series on Edexo Torsion. The first part will focus on background information about the presentation of Edexo Torsion, some of the difficulties in making this diagnosis in a timely manner, and then we'll move on to a summary of the imaging findings on ultrasound, CT, and MRI. In part two, we will correlate the appearance of torsion across these modalities with more detailed case presentations. Here are the learning objectives. Review the clinical presentation of adnexal torsion. Discuss the challenges in confirming the diagnosis of torsion. And review the appearance of torsion on ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Here's the definition of adnexal torsion. The ovary twists on its own axis. It involves a fallopian tube in two thirds of the cases. So adnexal torsion is technically more accurate than ovarian torsion. It can also involve just the ovary or just the fallopian tube. The twist causes compression first on the lower pressure ovarian veins and lymphatics. The ovary then becomes engorged, massively enlarged, and eventually arterial supply is compromised. Once arterial supply is compromised, hemorrhagic infarction occurs and the ovary is no longer salvageable. This pathogenesis is our guide to the imaging findings in order to diagnose adnexal torsion earlier and salvage more ovaries. We cannot wait until there is no ovarian blood flow detected on Doppler. At this point, the ovary can no longer be saved. We need to increase our detection so the ovary is enlarged and edematous but still has blood flow. We can avoid ovarian infarction, especially in reproductive age females, and avoid the risk of decreased fertility. The prevalence of adnexal torsion in females who present with acute pelvic pain is approximately 2 to 3%. The common risk factors are prior pelvic surgery, ovarian cysts, ovulation induction, and pregnancy. No risk factors are present in many patients with surgically confirmed torsion, and they find risk factors are hardly reported even if they are present. The clinical signs and symptoms are nonspecific and include most commonly acute pain, followed by nausea and vomiting, which is more common than in other GYN causes of pelvic pain and is a major take-home point that if you see nausea and vomiting in a history to increase your suspicion for adnexal torsion. Fever and palpable abdominal mass are less common. The history becomes more important on CT or MRI examination since in my experience those histories are more likely to use these terms whereas most ultrasound histories just say, you know, rule out torsion. Use the history provided by the tech worksheets as well, since you may get more detailed information from the patient. A retrospective study out of Toronto reviewed 86 cases of surgically proven adnexal torsion and examined the time between these four pivotal points in making the diagnosis of adnexal torsion and surgery. The mean time spent between each major step is summarized here. The average time between presenting to ED triage and the time of physician assessment was almost two hours. From that assessment to the receipt of an ultrasound report was five and a half hours. From that report to OR arrival time is 15 hours. The overall mean time of the entire process was about 22 hours. Although the absolute numbers may be very different in different healthcare systems, different countries, or even a different emergency department, this graphic nicely illustrates the steps in the patient journey and how they can add up to a significant delay in diagnosis and treatment, ultimately decreasing the odds of salvaging the ovary. This table summarized the time difference between those patients who still had a salvageable ovary at surgery and those who did not. It's no surprise that the longer the delay to surgery, the less chance there is of saving the ovary. Both mean and median timelines from ED triage to OR were significantly longer in the group with a non-salvageable ovary with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. The mean time from ED triage to OR was approximately 15 hours in the salvageable group, as opposed to almost 31 hours in the non-salvageable group. In this series, the longest time to surgery with a salvageable ovary was about 54 hours. So with that background, let's move on to the different ways that nexal torsion can appear in whatever modality you happen to encounter it in, starting first with the review of ultrasound and then moving on to CT and MRI, which may be less familiar to some of you. A massively enlarged ovary is the primary and sometimes the only ultrasound finding of adnexal torsion. 
Let me repeat that major take home point. A massively enlarged ovary is the primary and sometimes only ultrasound finding of adnexal torsion, typically positioned abnormally in the midline. Other ultrasound findings are increased central echogenicity, small peripheral follicles, a benign lead point mass, a twisted pedicle whirlpool, abnormal blood flow, which if they're found are highly specific for torsion, and free fluid. In addition to mentioned above, the absent central vascularity is associated with non-viability of the ovary. Ultrasound is first line when torsion is clinically suspected. In a systematic review of 663 cases of adnexal torsion, ultrasound had an overall accuracy of 79%, which admittedly is not great, but that compares with 42% for CT. I think this speaks to the general difficulty in making this diagnosis, especially in a potential salvageable ovary which still has internal blood flow. A quick word on Doppler ultrasound. Do not be falsely reassured by normal vascularity on Doppler. Arterial perfusion is maintained until late in the disease course. Venous abnormality, such as non-continuous flow on spectral Doppler, can be present in up to 100% of the cases and happens earlier, so it's easier to confirm the diagnosis if it's present. If arterial waveforms are obtained, high resistance flow is usually an indicator of torsion. Here's an example of a torsed ovary. Here we see an echogenic enlarged ovary with a volume of 68 cc. The normal right ovarian volume is 8 cc. We see adjacent complex free fluid. And here are the color and spectral Doppler findings. We see no internal color flow. Detected a great job of proving, hey look, there's internal flow we see in arterial waveform. But don't let that throw you off the diagnosis. This is still torsion, and yes, this is still a salvageable ovary. Our next example shows a massive enlarged ovary with a volume of 130 cc. This appearance alone is enough for me to call torsion regardless of what the Doppler shows. The color Doppler images here show no internal color flow and the spectral gate cannot find a waveform. This ovary is likely beyond salvage. So knowing the ultrasound findings, which are much more familiar, we can translate that to CT, which is especially helpful for emergency departments with limited ultrasound availability, and for patients with nonspecific or confounding symptoms that are scanned with CT first to rule out other pathologies. Again, the ovary is enlarged and may be midline seen in the majority of cases, 87 to 100%. A benign lead point mass with smooth, regular wall thickening is seen in 52 to 93% of cases. And a twisted pedicle, the quote, whirlpool sign, can be seen in 31 to 100% of cases. Pedicle soft tissue thickening also has a wide range of being reportedly found, ranging from 17 to 97%. The uterus can also be pulled to one side in 36 to 68 percent of cases, which is tougher to confirm on ultrasound. And adnexal stranding and a small amount of free fluid can be seen in 40 to 73 percent of cases. CT findings are more closely associated with a non-viable ovary or high attenuated hemorrhagic foci within the ovary, a lead point mass with more irregular eccentric wall thickening. If there's a contrast CT, lack of ovarian enhancement, and hemoperitoneum. Basically, a bleeding ovary is a necrotic ovary that is beyond saving. This diagnostic algorithm from a recent review is a bit eye-opening for me. I feel that a few questions from ED physicians after reading a CT is negative or no acute findings asking me basically, well, could there be torsion? And the reason for this is probably due to the ED resources, where CT is easier and more available than ultrasound, and is oftentimes the first study obtained when they have to decide whether or not to call on the ultrasound tech from home or do a limited point of care ultrasound themselves. These reviewers and others mention the idea of excluding torsion after normal CT and of more definitely calling it after typical CT features. In my earlier clinical experience, the left-hand side of this chart that starts with high suspicion of gynecologic causes and ultrasound first was more familiar to me. But now, 
after being a view ad for six or seven years, the right side of the chart rings a bit more true, namely increasing or decreasing the suspicion for torsion based solely off that first routine contrast enhanced CT with a goal of decreasing the amount of time before the patient gets the definitive care they need. Normal contrast enhanced CT has a high negative predictive value for torsion in one series of 283 patients who underwent contrast enhanced CT and color Doppler ultrasound. None of the 172 negative CT examinations were associated with a positive ultrasound. In this series, the CT was considered normal if none of the findings were present. Ovarian size, greater than five centimeters, free fluid, uterine deviation, fallopian tube thickening, ovarian fat stranding, smooth ovarian wall thickening, twisted pedicle sign, and abnormal ovarian enhancement. Keeping one's level of suspicion high on routine emergency CT is very important. Make sure the uterus and necks are on your CT checklist and specifically commented upon. This is where the clinical history can help. When the story is nausea and vomiting or rule out small bowel obstruction, I make specifically sure I check the ovaries before I dictate no acute findings in the impression, knowing how common nausea and vomiting is a presenting symptom in adnexal torsion. Here is the classic appearance of torsion on CT. Within the red circle is the enlarged midline pelvic mass, which is the torsed right ovary. The green circle surrounds the normal left ovary, and the red arrow is pointing to some complex pelvic free fluid. The MRI findings are basically the same as CT with an enlarged abnormally positioned ovary being the most reliable, followed closely by edema, which manifests as increased T2 signal. So again, to summarize, we have an enlarged midline ovary, T2 signal, peripheral high T2 follicles, the quote string of pearl signs that you see described on ultrasound, a benign appearing lead point mass with smooth wall thickening, a twisted pedicle, pedicle soft tissue thickening, the uterus possibly being pulled to one side, and small amount of free fluid with adjacent stranding. So again, a hemorrhagic ovary is a non-viable ovary. On MRI, you're looking for hemorrhagic foci, which manifests as high T1 signal, which is seen the majority of the time. A lead point mass with eccentric wall thickening, greater than 10 millimeter, approximately half the time, and lack of enhancement. Hemoperitoneum is again associated with non-viability. These T2 weighted axial images show the left ovary is massively enlarged, containing large, simple appearing cysts. Note the dependent free fluid. And the normal size of the right ovary. The coronal images clearly show the twisted left adnexal pedicle, leaving no doubt that this is adnexal torsion. Regardless of the imaging modality, ovarian enlargement and edema are the most reliable indicators of adnexal torsion. This diagnosis must be considered whenever you see a unilaterally enlarged and edematous ovary, regardless of the modality you encounter it with. The presence of a preserved arterial blood flow does not exclude adnexal torsion. Rather, internal blood flow is a sign of a potentially salvageable ovary. Because of the non-specific clinical presentation, torsion may first present on ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Aside from acute pelvic pain, nausea and vomiting are the most common symptoms reported by patients with adnexal torsion. Delays in diagnosis decrease the chances of salvaging the ovary. Thanks again for watching.